I'd like to invite our attention this evening to the book of Philippians. We have been spending some time in 1 Timothy chapter 6, thinking about and talking about contentment. And as you know, if we have a model of contentment other than the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, it's certainly uh, the Apostle Paul. He's the one that writes to Timothy and says, contentment with godliness is great gain. Contentment means sufficient, sufficiency. And to the Stoic mind, to the philosophical mind of that day, it was a self-sufficiency. For the believer, it is a sufficiency in Christ. It's a sufficiency within and without. And Paul says in Philippians 4.11, I have learned to be content. So as we begin this evening, I want to just take some time asking questions of us to cause us to think about uh, the reality of the challenge that is before us in being a people who are content. We're in the Thanksgiving month. Uh, we're in the month where we tend to give our attention more and more to gratitude and thankfulness. And I think contentment uh, fits right with that. I think humanly speaking, uh, we are satisfied, we are content, uh, we uh, find joy specifically uh, the way God has designed us in, um, in relationships as well as in circumstances that are agreeable to us. Now, before you write that off as something that is out there somewhere, uh, think about what God has provided in the garden and what God has promised in heaven. God has promised us what we had and what we lost in the garden. Uh, the perfection of that place was a perfection of relationship with God, relationship between Adam and Eve, and a satisfaction and contentment with that garden, that place God had put them in. God put them there to tend and to keep. God put them there to be somewhat of earth sovereigns over the things that God has created. As image bearers, they found great satisfaction and contentment in their relationship with God, in their relationship with each other, and really in the situation and circumstance in which they found themselves. So when you and I think about satisfaction, sufficiency, contentment, we really are thinking about how God created things and how God's going to return things. We're talking about there being no disease, no death, uh, no agitation, no conflict, uh, no difficulty, no sin, no sadness, no sorrow. Uh, that's heaven, folks. And that is going to be a place of great contentment for us and the place that God has promised to us. In the meantime, <laughs> we live down here. And uh, we live down here in a sin-cursed world as sin-cursed people. And we find a level of contentment and satisfaction in relationships because God's built us that way. And we find a level of satisfaction in circumstances when they're good. Uh, this week, if you can't enjoy the weather, something's wrong with you, right? A little bit of moisture yesterday, but other than that, we're saying, wow, this is bonus for November in Northeast Ohio, right? And, the, and when you hear a report that they're, they're predicting maybe through Thanksgiving, we'll have this kind of weather. You'll understand why I grew up down south, because this is the kind of weather we have down there. Uh, but it, it's, it's nice to get up to a sunshiny day. And you don't get up in the morning resisting that. You say, Lord, this, this, this warm sun makes me happy. It makes me happy. When you read about the, in the scriptures about blessedness, what is he talking about? It's talking about food that is enjoyed. It's talking about harmony among people. It's talking about paradise. And so we want to make sure that we even get down to the ABC somewhat and understand that God has made us in such a way that we desire good relationships and we desire good circumstances. The challenge for us is when the circumstances are not good and when the relationships are not as we would desire that they be. And so in spending some time thinking about that over the next few weeks, I, I just felt like I needed to back up. And uh, I, I even have contemplated, maybe I just need to preach through the first three chapters of Philippians before I go to chapter four, because what happens in chapter four is Paul picks up the threads from chapters 1, 2, and 3 and weaves them together in final application for us. 
And so he lays so much groundwork that leads up to that, that what we're going to have to do in chapter four at, at bare minimum is we're going to have to reach back and pick up some of those threads and recognize that when he says, I have learned to be content, there was a process through which he learned to be content. And he is sharing that, folks, with us. He's sharing that with the Philippians so that they will learn to be content. And discontentment is something that we struggle with. And, and contentment is something that the Lord would teach us. So this letter is a, a really a powerful uh, and, and personal letter. Uh, it's one of Paul's most loved letters. It has been personal throughout. It's been filled with relational language. It's been filled with specific challenges that were part of the apostle's life, his own life, his individual life. So I ask that you consider reading this and rereading this during the, the month of November. Pray over it and ask the Lord to teach you. Make some notes. Just make a note or two. Read, a, read four or five verses and say, ask yourself the question, what, what is the Lord saying here? What is Paul hitting at here? What, what do I need to take away from this? But as for tonight, I'd like to give us a bit of an introduction to pave the way uh, for our future study which is actually in the fourth chapter. And I want to do this under the title of Embracing the Challenge Personally. Now, as soon as I say that, you're going to say what I would say, and that is what challenge? <laughs> what are you talking about? Embracing the challenge personally. What challenge are we talking about? Well, let me say it this way. What we're talking about is the challenge to be everything that God saved you to be. Now, there's not a believer here that that doesn't resonate with. The challenge is to be all that you have been saved to be. Okay? The challenge is to be all that you have been saved to be. And we could turn that a little the other way and say the challenge is to be all that you were designed to be. The challenge to be all that you were designed to be. Folks, we were designed to be content. We were designed to be settled in our relationship with the Lord and other people. We're image bearers, and that's built into us, even though sin has tainted that. So if you'll think of it this way, I think it'll help you. It'll help us to think this out. The challenge is to be all that you have been saved to be, but to turn it another way, to think about God's creative design, the challenge is to be all that you were designed to be. Now, the first word that comes to mind in that is the idea of image bearing, bearing his image. Christ likeness would be part of that answer. The, uh, the idea of being who God would have us to be relationally. You realize how hard the world is grasping after this? Do you hear any of the world's songs? Do you understand the, the hallmark mentality? What is being sought for over and over and over? The perfect what? Relationship. The perfect relationship. And what they do is they set that up and, and you could write them now because they set it up and you say, okay, at the end, that guy is going to be with that gal. Why? Because that's what the world is all about. What are the songs of the world all about? The songs of the world are all about everything being right, right? Everything being right. The relationships being right. The situation being right, the circumstance being right. This is built into us relational uh, contentment. What, the challenge to be all that you've been saved to be in regards to personal integrity. None of us likes to be taken advantage of. All of, love, all of us love that person that can be trusted. <laughs> There's something in believers that want to be that person that can be trusted. There's something in us that yearns to tell the truth when we shade the truth or we say nothing instead of speaking the truth there's something inside of us that jars us because we want to be people of integrity we love people of integrity we want to be people of integrity because people of integrity is who God has saved us to be this idea of loving responsibility loving responsibility honesty humility moldability I love the word simplicity when it's rightly understood so the challenge is that which is revealed in the, world, in the word as what is indeed Christian. 
It's the thrust of discipleship. It's the goal of saving grace. It's the impact of the gospel to make me into that which I could not otherwise be. It is the example of Christ. It's the testimony of the believers in the book of Acts. It's the imperatives in the epistles that are written to the church. The words of contentment and joy and peace and satisfaction. And as far as we can understand it, all of those are spiritual growth issues. I would say to you tonight, that's the challenge of every believer. I would say to you, this is the heart of Christianity. It's, it's to be someone other than we are in our sinful state naturally, right? It's to be other than we are. It's to be supernaturally changed into something that we could not otherwise be. It's the passion of those whose heart are set afire for the Lord. So what is the challenge? The challenge is to be all that you've been saved to be. The challenge is to be all that you were designed to be. How can that happen? Boy, every time I pick up the word of God and you pick up the word of God, I think we, we see that there has to be a, a radical, a radical rewriting of the way that we think. A radical rewriting of the way that we think. If you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and you're seeking to be who God would have you to be and you find yourself in a conflict, you find yourself in, in what seems a, a, an insurmountable impasse. And for a time being, you step away from that. You settle your heart. If you're a believer who has some sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, you're saying in your own heart, you're asking the Lord to help you see where you are making excuses for yourself. Where you are excusing your sin. When you are making exception for yourself. Do you ever find yourself expecting something of someone else that you don't expect of yourself? Standard way up here. <laughs> for them. A radical rewriting of how we think. That's what the scriptures teach. A renewal of mind, Romans 12, 1 and 2. A radical rewriting of how we think. Secondly, in the how and the answer to how, there needs to be a radical rewriting of the way we think. But secondly, there needs to be a resultant reshaping of our attitudes. A reshaping of our words and a reshaping of our actions. The Lord Jesus Christ says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so... This radical rewriting of how I think is purposeful because it will reshape my attitudes. It'll reshape my responses. It'll reshape my words. It'll reshape my actions. It will radically and beautifully change who I am. I want to be married to the person who is like Christ. My wife wants to be married to the person who is like Christ. You want to be married to the person who is like Christ. You want a parent who is like Christ. You want children who are like Christ. You want your grandchildren to be like Christ. If you're a Christian, that's the core of your, your very purpose in this life. The people you see come to Christ under your gospel ministry, you want to see them be like Christ. Why? Because you know that's the blessed place. You know how miserable you are when you're not. And so the challenge, embracing the challenge personally is the challenge to be all that we've been saved to be. The challenge to be all that you were designed to be. Folks, that works. <laughs> that works. God has so deemed that when he saves us, he establishes us positionally as without sin before him. He removes it. It's not there anymore. The barrier's gone. Thank God for that. You stand redeemed. We sing that, don't we? I stand redeemed. I've been bought by the blood of Christ. The sin penalty has been paid. And now God has clothed me in the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at me, God the Father looks at me. He sees his son. And I'm clothed in his righteousness. I, I'm so thankful for that. I suspect I should thank God for that all day, every day. Thank you for not seeing Mike. Thank you for seeing Christ. Practically, however, 
I have to keep praying, Lord, please let there be more of you and less of me. Lord, please, practically, let there be less of me and more of you. What are our resources in this? Embracing the challenge personally, what resources do we have? I would say to you, first of all, we have the regenerating Holy Spirit living in us, don't we? We have the regenerating Holy Spirit living in us. That's what happens at salvation. We're born again. The regenerating Holy Spirit lives within us. We also have the written and the living word always before us. The written and the living word always before us. Isn't it interesting that when God made his ultimate revelation, he didn't yell it out from heaven. He didn't speak it out of glory. He became man. It's a fascinating thing to think about. We have the written word, but then we have his ultimate revelation in the what? In the living word, the person of Jesus Christ. So you say, what resources do I have for God to make me who he saved me to be? Well, you first of all, the Holy Spirit living in your heart. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, and he made you alive. You were spiritually dead. You were resurrected with Christ, right? You have spiritual life through the resident Holy Spirit living in your soul. You also have the written word and the living word always before you. Now, both of those come to us through the written word, right? We have the gospels, and we see Jesus standing there. We don't, we don't see him like the disciples did, but we have him put before us. And that's why saturating ourselves with the gospels is so very important, because we walk away and we say... Oh, Jesus wouldn't have acted like that. He wouldn't have just done that. Yeah, that person shouldn't have done that, but Jesus would not have responded like I just responded because when they reviled him, he what? He reviled not again. So how do we know what that looks like? We have Jesus standing in front of us. We have Jesus walking the path. We shy away from the people Jesus touched. And we said, there's another area where I'm not like Christ. We stand in judgment. Jesus allowed her to wash his feet. We make sure we don't get infected. Jesus touched the leper. The testimony of the Good Samaritan is a testimony of someone that stands there as an example that Jesus gives as to what it means to be altered, to be changed. There's the challenge. The resources, first of all, the regenerating Holy Spirit living within us. Secondly, the written and living word that's always before us. Thirdly, we have believing brothers and sisters around us. We have believing brothers and sisters around us. I'm not sure how we've gotten away from this. But the Bible says we're a family. The Bible says we're a body. And the Bible says every part of the body is a vital part of the body. And you can't read any of the things that Paul has written without understanding that he is talking to a body of believers, believing brothers and sisters who are there to help one another, to assist one another, to love one another, to bear one another's burdens. So we have the regenerating Holy Spirit living within us. We have the written and living word always before us. We have the believing brothers and sisters around us. God never intended for anybody to be a Christian in isolation. And although that's growing more and more popular in the day in which we live, that is completely counter to what the scripture teaches. Someone that thinks they do not need the body, the body does not understand the Bible. There is no church without a body. And so when I'm thinking about this struggle, guess what? God sent those disciples out two by two. And I suspect there was times when one would be down and another would help them back up. Paul always had somebody with him. Why? Because we weren't intended to walk through this life by ourselves. There are no maverick, independent Christians in the Bible. We're part of the body. And if you're part of the body and you have a gift, according to the scripture, then you're supposed to exercise your gift, what? Within the body. And thank God we're different in that way. And so you have that and I have that. We have them to encourage us and exhort us. We have them to come alongside of us. We have the regenerating Holy Spirit living within us. We have the written and living word always before us. We have the believing brothers and sisters around us. Fourthly, we have the sovereign, loving father ruling over us. We have the sovereign, loving Father ru ruling over us. 
Everything in the scripture is God-centered. Everything in the scripture keeps us looking beyond what we can see and recognizing that there is a sovereign God, a loving father who is ruling over this world and ruling among and over his people. So fourthly, we have the sovereign, loving father ruling over us. Folks, we are his children. And time and time again, in the introduction to these epistles that Paul wrote, he talks about the Father. He talks about God the Father. And I'll give you a fifth one. You could add to this list, maybe think it out. Maybe we could talk together about it. But you also, and I have, the company of witnesses who've run the race before us. God puts this before us in Hebrews chapter 11. He goes back and basically goes through the history of what he's written in, in the scriptures and gives us this company of witnesses. We're surrounded with a company of witnesses who've run the race before us. And there's debate back and forth about, uh, you know, whether they're cheering us on or whatever. And I'm not sure anybody's going to be able to iron that out. I think they are examples for us or we wouldn't be given. I think they are and would be cheering us on as we run the faith race. It's a company of witnesses. We have the company of witnesses who have run the race before us. So you've heard Father and Son and Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters in Christ, and a company of witnesses who've run the race before us. So embracing the challenge personally, what challenge? The challenge to be all that you have been saved to be. The challenge to be all that you were designed to be. How? By a radical rewriting of how we think without any exceptions or excuses for ourselves. Which manifests itself in a resultant reshaping of our attitudes. A reshaping of our words. A reshaping of our actions. Our resources include the regenerating Holy Spirit who lives within us, the written and the living word which is always before us, the believing brothers and sisters who are around us, the sovereign, loving Father who is ruling over us, and the company of witnesses who have run the race before us. Folks, we have been blessed by God. He's given us everything we need. To find our sufficiency in God is to find what is sufficient because only God knows what we need and he's given all of it to us. And not part of it making up for another part of it, but all of it part of what God's doing. I need to see other brothers and sisters in Christ who are running and struggling. And I need to, in a very profound way, be putting my arms around them and running the race with them. I need to be watching men like Abraham like we have for the last 10 chapters in the book of Genesis. say, so you know what? He faltered and failed. <laughs> he was self-deceiving. Tried to deceive people around him. He tried to orchestrate everything instead of waiting on the Lord. If we just went through all of those stories again. I think most of us would have to say. We might sheepishly. But we say I can relate to Abraham. I can relate to Abraham. I can relate to Abraham. And yet God in heaven told the story with every detail. That we needed to know. But when he turns to the New Testament and says, I want to show you the father of your faith. You know what he didn't show you? Any of the faltering. Why? Because he's rejoicing in the faith. He's rejoicing in the faith. He's showing us that even a man like that who falters can be the father of the faithful. He's justified by what? Faith. And so we have been granted everything that we need through the provision of God to be who God would have us to be. The challenge is scriptural. It's written on the pages of the scripture. And I want to begin by turning to the first chapter of Philippians and just share a couple of things with you tonight. I spent a good bit of time in the introduction because I want you to understand what I would like for us to think out together, what I would like for us to flesh out together as we try to move forward in our understanding of contentment. Is this truly what the Lord has for us? Well, when we turn to the first chapter of Philippians, we read Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, 
grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul breaks into a prayer of thanksgiving and concern for them by saying, verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And then he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, my understanding of verse number six is that it has individual application, but that it is primarily in this context, a testimony about the church itself. What God had begun to do in the church, he's praying always for all of them. And he's confident that what God has begun, he will perform. He will carry it on to completion. What God has begun in his people, he will carry it forth to the point of completion. So embracing the challenge personally is taking personally the call to discipleship. It's embracing wholly the impact of saving grace in our lives. In the first verse, Paul says, uh, we're writing, we're servants of Christ, we're writing to all the saints. So I ask a question tonight there on your page, is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? I think it's a fair question. He's writing to the saints. And so you have a question there before you. Is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? This is a simple greeting to all of a particular group. But who's in that group? Saints. Where are these saints? They're at Philippi. They are saints in the church at Philippi. Paul is writing to a particular group of people, and that particular group of people are saints in a particular location, and that is Philippi. So it's a very simple greeting that we can read over, but we have to remember that's a Holy Spirit-inspired greeting with profound and eternal implications. And Paul, in writing everything he does, and in calling us to learn to be content like he has, is talking to people who are spiritually alive. This is not a, a religious moral ideal. It's going to really be good for you all if you were content people. No, he's saying, because you are spiritually alive, because you are set apart by God as saints... Because you are Christ's people. So he's writing to saints. Is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? You say, this is overly simple tonight. Is it not actually very necessary to ask the question, am I included in the group that Paul's talking to? Am I included? Is there evidence in Mike's life that he is a born again believer? If you ask me the question after the service, Pastor, tell me about your spiritual birth. I should be able to communicate to you my testimony of when I came under the conviction of God's Holy Spirit that I was a sinner and I was in trouble. And I became convinced. That if I was left to pay for my own sin, I would spend eternity in hell separated from God. Because a sinner can burn forever and never pay for their sin, right? But that Jesus Christ bore my guilt and the guilt of humanity on the cross. And that he was everything that God has declared him to be. The sinless son of God. The mediator between God and man. The one that could die 
and his righteousness be credited to Mike's account. And then I bowed and repented of my sin, confessed Jesus Christ as my Savior, put my faith and trust in him, and received spiritual birth. I would tell you, based upon the word of God, that I am justified in God's sight, that God marked it down, justified in Mike's account. He reckoned me righteous, based on the merits of his son, but that he also at the same time gave me spiritual life. And I would tell you, I had new hungers. I had new desires. I had fresh hatred for things that I was involved in before Christ. I still have a fresh hatred for what is inside of me called the flesh that I can't effectively expel. And I would say with Paul, oh, wretched man that I am. Can we say as we begin to read a book like this that there is tangible evidence that I am a saint? Am I included in the sphere of the intended audience? Am I part of the family to whom the apostle writes? He's writing to the saints, all the saints that are at Philippi. Paul gives his name up front. Now, Paul is the author's Roman name, and Saul is the author's Hebrew name. So in the book of Acts, we read of Saul of Tarsus. And when we hear him addressing the churches, he uses his Roman name, Paul. And he himself was a Jewish convert whose life was radically changed. When I read Acts chapter 9 and you read Acts chapter 9, you say, my, my, what a transformation took place in that man's life. He's headed out to persecute Christ's church. God arrest him on the road to Damascus. And what was he? He was converted. He was born again. And he was never the same. He's always basking in God's mercy for doing that. He said, I'm going to tell you something. You want to look at an example of what God can do. Saul of Tarsus is now Paul the Apostle. So the man that's writing the letter has a testimony, doesn't he? He's a saint. He stands before us as a man whose life is radically changed. You might be interested that the pronouns for Paul, I, me, and my 50 of them in the book of Philippians. It's a Christ-centered book. But Paul, the apostle, is overwhelmed with the reality of who he is as a participant with the Lord. And then he says, Timothy, Paul and Timothy, verse number one, Timothy, who's he? He's a convert of Paul, the apostle. He's somebody that came to Christ through the ministry of Paul. He's a man that was discipled by Paul. He was a man that is a co-worker of Paul who actually pastored in Ephesus. How is it that Timothy is who he is? Because he was as Paul and as every saint, he was born again. And at this point in time, he is with Paul. And where is Paul? He's in a Roman prison. It isn't just like God to use an apostle who for all practical purposes, his ministry has shut down. He's stopped. He's in a Roman prison. And he's talking about in every chapter about joy and rejoicing. And in the fourth chapter, he's saying, I have learned in whatever state I am to be what? Content. How do you explain that? He's a saint. He's born again. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. He has been transformed and is still in the transformation process because he at the same time in the next breath could tell you, I don't know a worse sinner than Paul the apostle. I am the chief of sinners, but he's a saint. 
And so we have Paul and we have Timothy, two saints, two men that have been converted, writing to the Philippian church, which is made up of those who are saints. And they refer to themselves, Paul writing about, for him and Timothy, he says, we are the servants, first chapter, first verse, we are the servants of Jesus Christ. We have a new master. We are bond slaves. We are bond slaves in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul in no way could tell you in chapter 4 that he had learned to be content if Paul didn't tell you and tell me in chapter number 1 that he was in a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. He would have nothing to say to us about contentment if God had not taught him to be content. He said, I am a chosen slave. I have voluntarily yielded up my will to God and I'm writing to you to share with you what God has for you as saints. We're slaves to Jesus Christ. We're seeking to reflect Christ in our servanthood. We're living as saints and we're ministering to saints. Paul could say, be followers of me as I am a follower of him. I'm, I'm modeling Christ. I'm instructing you about Christ. I'm, I'm challenging you to be like Christ. I'm calling you to the contentment of Christ. Embracing the challenge personally, is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? You have a second question there under that main question. Was there a time when I heard the gospel and responded in faith? I gave you point in time conversion of Paul in Acts chapter 9. Timothy. Led to Christ by Paul. We don't have the details of Timothy's life, but we see a man whose life was changed. He was converted. Was there a time when I heard the gospel and responded in faith? See, you don't grow into Christianity. You grow into religion. You can grow into a moral belief system. You can even grow into a biblical worldview, by the way. It doesn't mean you've been born again. It doesn't mean you've come to a point in time in life where you have heard and understood the gospel and responded in faith. Is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? Was there a time when I heard the gospel and responded in faith? So Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ in verse 1, are writing to all, to every saint without exception. Every saint which is in Christ Jesus, every saint which is in Christ Jesus and at Philippi, every saint that includes the leadership, the bishops and the deacons, those that serve the saints, those that serve the church. So this is really an inclusive term that refers to all of those that have been made holy through saving grace. And this is the foundation upon which the entire book is written. He's really writing to the whole of the church. He's writing to the holy people of God that are located in the Philippian church. He's writing to those who are in Christ Jesus. He's writing to those who are in union with Christ Jesus in his perfect righteousness. He's writing to those who are spiritually set apart by the indwelling spirit of Christ. The ones being in Philippi, holy, distinct, separated unto Christ, living in this world as citizens of heaven. It really is a unique orientation of life that he writes about. Those that seek things that are above, embracing the challenge personally, is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? Please be honest in answering that. Was there a time when I heard the gospel and responded in faith? Secondly, does my life does my life attest to my belonging to and serving a holy master? Does my life attest to my belonging to and serving a holy master? You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a specific life. 
A specific life, put your name in there, a specific life that's lived out in a specific place in time. Does my life attest to my belonging to and serving a holy master? A specific life lived out in a specific place in time. A sanctified life lived out in 2022 where you live. Where you dwell, where you work, where you do business. A life that's identifiably the Christ life. Lived out in the real circumstances of time, space. Is my life one of a spiritual identity? Turn your attention back to chapter number 16 of Acts. I don't know how these things go for you. I don't know how your mind works when you are involved in reading these stories. I have been exposed to these things all of my life. Because of that, there is sometimes a disconnect. <laughs> and sometimes I'll read some things like Paul says to the Philippian people and I'll forget that the Philippian people the people of Christ, the people that are saints, weren't always saints. And sometimes I get that letter over there and I start looking at the pieces and the parts and I start trying to take that apart and trying to figure that out and understand that because not only do I want to apply it to myself, but I need to share it with God's people. And I forget that every one of them has a story and that God told the story. So there was in Philippi, people who were not saints, who did not know the Lord, who God brought to himself through the gospel. And so when you get down to verse number 11 of Acts chapter 16, you read, therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samanthracia and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi. So the story is being told by Luke. Philippi is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. It's re really a very small colony. We were in that city abiding certain days. We stayed there for a period of time. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was what to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So evidently, there was no synagogue. And the God fears were out on the Sabbath by the river praying. And here's an individual named Lydia, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tyra Tyra, which worshiped God, heard us. So they shared Christ with her. It says, whose heart? The Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. She responded to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In verse 15, when she was baptized in her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And so she put up the missionaries. Verse 16, it came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Well, the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, now don't forget this damsel is demon possessed. And so she might give somewhat of an accurate testimony, but there would be a diminishing of that testimony because of who she is. And she kept crying out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. He delivered her from that demon possession. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they called Paul, Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates 
saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. The multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. Supposing that the prisoners had been fled, he would have done that because the Roman would have, Romans would have taken his life for letting them get away. Verse 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm. For we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had besought or brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. whole household trusted Christ. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. The keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul, no doubt, concerned about the other believers, concerned about the church there, said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words into the magistrates and they feared when they heard they were Romans. They came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. So what happened? How can Paul write to saints at Philippi these few years later? There weren't any saints at Philippi until the gospel came. And what happened to Lydia and what happened to this demon-possessed girl and what happened to this prisoner and his family? What happened to them? They are born again. Their life was forever altered. What was Paul doing, by the way, when God shook the prison? Doing the thing he tells us in every chapter to do in the book. Rejoicing as some kind of nut case, a few, <laughs> a few sails down, isn't there? Listen to those guys. It's midnight and they're singing praise to the Lord. Obviously the prisoner heard what they were singing and God used their testimony to bring these people to himself. So what is your story? What is your story tonight? When did you become a saint? When were you born again? Do you realize how often the Bible talks about, particularly all through the Old Testament, would you people, the people of God, please stop. Would you look back and remember what God has done for you? Would you please remember what God has done for you? Why would God say that so many times? Why would Paul so many times say, I want to tell you what God did for me? Because no doubt Paul understood that at the foundation of rejoicing and living a contented life is remembering what God has done in granting you spiritual life and granting you eternal hope and granting you 
living truth. What is your story tonight? How might it be written in the history of Christianity? What is the tangible evidence of the mastery of Jesus Christ over your life? We have a god fear Lydia. We have a demon-possessed damsel. We have a Philippian jailer and his family. We have God at work in tangible ways making sinners into saints. Folks, that's what God does. Do you realize there is no gospel proclamation in the New Testament that does not include lives being changed? There's a lot of religion that doesn't change anybody, but there's no gospel. There's no new birth. There's no spiritual life inside of you that does not change who you are. Time and time again, for lack of time tonight, we cannot go to the multiple references that teach this truth. I've got the word grace written down there. I just put there Paul's theology. I just wanted you to get this from verse number two of our text. Paul begins every, he wrote 13 letters. And you can check this out. In the introduction to all of his letters, he greets them in terms of grace and peace. Peace, grace and peace. This is the second verse, Philippians 1, verse number 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What is grace? Well, I'd say in a word, that's Paul's theology. And that is, that line there, I'll give you a little bit of a definition. It's a freely provided salvation based on the merits of Christ. That's Paul's theology. A freely provided salvation based on the merits of Christ. Then you have the word peace. He always says it, grace and peace. I would put there, it's Paul's application. Paul's theology is a theology of grace, a freely provided salvation based on the merits of Christ. Paul's application is peace. What is peace? Well, I would say, and you would probably agree and say it's, it's somewhat of an inward serenity, right? Uh, an inward serenity of heart. But I would suggest it's more than that. It is a full orb. The word we want here is wholeness. W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S. -S. Wholeness. A full orb wholeness of life that's at rest with God and with others. You say, what are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that what Paul's going to teach in chapter 4, he already introduced in the second verse of his letter. Contentment. Satisfaction, sufficiency, a whole, a full orbed wholeness of life that is at rest with God and at rest with others. Grace and peace. First of all, it's father initiated. This comes in other places, but I thought we'd just put it before us tonight. Something we can go back to and think about together in the future. It's father initiated. It's son accomplished. It's something that. Jesus Christ accomplished, and it's Holy Spirit applied. And if you are a saint, if you have been born again, you understand that. This salvation was initiated by the Father. It was accomplished by the Son. It's applied to your life. Spiritual life comes to you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To be born again is to be born anew. It's to be born from above. Embracing the challenge personally, is there tangible evidence that I am a saint? I don't think for a minute that we don't need to be asked that question. I don't think for a minute that we don't need to regularly hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I do believe that if we hurry on to all of the things the book tells us without understanding what he's talking about when he's talking about grace and peace... We, we hurry on as a liability to us. We walk around with our heads down thinking, I can't do that. And if we're not thinking rightly, we think, well, I'm, I'm an exception to that. If God, if God understood what I was dealing with, he wouldn't expect that to me. No, there are no exceptions. There are no excuses. If you're born again, this is what God has for you and what God has for me. And can I say this to you? If you are born again tonight, there's something inside of you. This resonates with you. That's what I want. I want that full 
orbed wholeness of soul. That's at peace with God and peace with others. I want that relational soundness that only God can minister to me through his spirit, through the new birth, which he provides for us. Father, we thank you. Uh, we can become very mechanical. We can become very definitional in our thoughts about contentment, even our thoughts about Christianity. And Father, for some reason, you have allowed a check in my own spirit in regards to assuming that we are all saints. And forgetting that Saul of Tarsus was no saint. Timothy was no saint. The Philippian jailer and Lydia and the demoniac girl, they were no saints until they came face to face with the gospel of Jesus Christ and were converted. And none of this in this book is for unbelieving people. People who are spiritually dead cannot live this life. And Father, if there's no yearning for this life, if there's no longing for this life, then there's a need to ask myself the question, is there evidence that I have indeed been born again? I pray for these dear folk tonight. Thank you for our time together, for the songs we've been able to sing. Thank you, Father, for allowing us just to sit for a little bit tonight to raise some questions about the challenge that's before us in regards to contentment with godliness before we embark upon some further understanding of how it was that Paul learned to be content. I pray that we would deal with our own souls. And if we are born again and are not spending time rejoicing in what you've done to save us, may it be that we leave this place with the intent to spend time speaking to you daily about our gratefulness for what you've done for us. And Father, if there is no evidence of spiritual life, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make that clear. We believe according to your word that you're not willing that any should perish. You do not desire that anybody sit here week after week and hear your word without coming to you in faith. I pray for those possibly that have made a profession and their life remains unchanged, Father, that this would be the night of their salvation, that we'd see you at the soul level radically change them through the new birth. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Forgive us for taking them for granted, for reacting against them, for not loving them as we should. And move us forward, we pray, as a congregation. May there be clear commitment to you, clear conviction about what your word teaches, a full confidence in our great God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.